Godfather, which is a 6.8 on IMDb and 89% on Rotten Tomatoes. This came out in 1987. Now, at this time, let me give you the landscape, the, the background of movies back then, or the horror genre. This is in the peak of Freddy, Jason, Michael is coming back along at this time. He's about to come back with Halloween 4. So we're kind of in the, the slasher phase at this time, 1987. Probably Pumpkinheads around here somewhere, too. Um, Prom Night 2, I think, was around the same time as well. Um, so... This movie, I can see why it, it only made two million at the box office. So now apparently the budget's only one million, so it did make back its money. But most of the money and most of the no notoriety this movie has came came later from its home video release. When it first came out, it bombed big time at the box office, made two million. And the reason I think is because probably this is marketed like a slasher, but it's really more of like a thriller, or I'm a little bit too smart to be like just ca called a slasher. So it doesn't really fit in with like the Jasons and the Michaels. So I can see why at that time the audience was kind of like, eh, I don't know. But does it feel like it doesn't feel like it fits that time period, right? It feels more like so, a 90s thriller, I feel like. So even though we're going to talk about it, I'm going to just jump right into it and say, when the movie first starts with you meeting our villain in Jerry, otherwise, or Henry, as he's known in that in that family. Hey, you get his fake identity correct, all right? I know. He paid, a, he paid a lot of money for that fake identity, all right? All yeah, right. problem is he can't even keep it straight. Um, but when we first meet him and he's getting getting ready, getting himself clean, shaven, getting ready to start a new life, he comes downstairs, we see three dead bodies. And I'm thinking to myself, so this is going to be a slasher. <laughs> you know, a lot of the reviews really like praise this opening scene because... They're like, it sets a very weird tone because you see him all like happy go lucky and all like whistling and just like, and then he's walking by these dead bodies and like a little kid's dead body. And you're like, well, this is like, this is kind of different. This is like dark as hell. But then also he's like all just like going about his business if he's going to work pretty much as if it's like a, just a random Tuesday. So. so he wasn't going to work. He was just going somewhere else. Yeah. Um. So, um. Yeah, so just to go back to a second to the background, 1987, the director of the movie actually was not a fan of slashers. So he was given the script. The script was already written before he, it was a, a different writer than the director. And the director saw the script and he was like, the one thing about it, he was like, I want to make sure I'll do it, but I want to make sure it's not a, a slasher. He wanted to definitely take it more like in a Hitchcock thriller type, a thriller, mystery type, whatever direction. And the other movies the director has done actually have been like, thrillers like he has a movie called sleeping with the enemy with julia roberts that's a thriller most notably he has a movie called the good son with macaulay culkin uh which i don't know if you remember this movie it's macaulay culkin playing a freaking psycho like macaulay culkin is the killer in the movie i haven't seen it like this is like in the middle of the home alone craze <laughs> he's like uh terrorizing elijah wood um i would definitely so recommend elijah wood well those would be the two kid actors back then i think so uh, I would definitely recommend watch The Good Son if you get a chance. That's a good movie from this director also. Uh, but yeah, so that kind of tells you where it's going because he didn't want to be a typical slasher. That's why this movie is not going to have a high body count. It's going to have a very low body count. He wanted to make it more thriller-ish. Um, now, it that's kinda, it. It kind of has more kills already than night, the first Nightmare on Elm Street. Now, how do you... <laughs> I guess it... I guess it depends on if you count these opening scene, if you count this opening scene as kills. I know we see so, dead bodies, but so I don't know. The only reason I personally would is because you eventually do get to, you, you get their names eventually. You kind of get to know them as minor characters eventually. Mm -hmm. So because we eventually get to know what the backstory is about them. It, I, would it's, say, I wouldn't say you get to know them. That's kind of strong. I would say you. You feel bad as for minor them. as minor characters, but you also, but but you also get to see the bodies. It's one story being told. Oh, there's bodies. There's another thing getting to actually see the carnage. The uh, the cinematographer, the one who was like setting up the shots. So I saw an interview with him, and he was like, the day of filming that, he was very worried because he was like, he's like, we got this kid lying on the ground, with like blood on their face, and we're like, we're thinking like are we like just traumatizing the hell out of this kid? Like, I hope they, they get it. <laughs> so he was like on, he was like, while they're filming the scene, he walked by like, I guess two kids like blunder heads basically. And he's like, the kids are like asking each other. I was like, Hey, do you want to go get lunch after this? 
So he was like, okay, we're good. They're just like, totally like, they know what this is pretty much. They're talking about what they want to eat for lunch and stuff. So they're like not taking this that serious because that's true. You got to get a kid actor to be like, okay, to play dead on the ground. We're going to like pour blood all over you. That, that's pretty, for, pretty crazy. So I'm sorry for one, for a kid in the eighties, that's probably trick or treat time. <laughs> <laughs> they brought, I guarantee you, they took that fake blood, licked their lips with it, but the, they probably like, you could give them the bucket of fake blood and be like, okay, you're going to be killed. How would you like to die? Put this all over your body on how you'd like to die. And that kid be just drenched in it. Plus, you could pay them with candy and save money on the budget. So this is a low budget movie. So they're like, here, here's seven Reese's pieces. That's that's your salary. So that's scale. So for them. So it's like, sorry, we don't have money, but can we pay you in gum? They're like, flavored gum? Better not be that mint <laughs> gum, that mint bullshit. <laughs> all right. I, I, um, I prefer cherry gum. Thank you very much. So, okay, let's talk about the opening scene with one one specific thing. Though. Okay, so at the beginning, we really don't know. We're going to find out later, basically, that he was the stepfather for this family and then killed them. Yes. We don't know. We don't know if this is the first time he's done it or if he's done it previous times before that. Now, um, you made a point um, earlier when we were talking about I mean, he's putting his hands over everything. So it's a question of like, hey, the cops come in. This dude's fingerprints are everywhere. Um, later on, it's explained that he... Somebody with a fake identity, his, his fingerprints aren't traceable. So um, so it's like, has he had a lot of previous fake identities? Has How many times has he done this? We just don't know. They don't give that much background on it. But I will say this. This is based on a real-life situation a killer called John List in the 80s. He um, had killed his mom and his wife and his kids, left them for dead in a similar fashion, and then disappeared. He wasn't a stepfather, nothing to do with that. And there was no thing about him doing it over and over again. It was just one isolated incident. But the thing that was true was the idea that he had been setting up a different life. So when he did it, he disappeared completely. Hmm. So that happened in the, like early to mid '80s. So when they made this movie, that dude was still hadn't been caught. He was still on the loose. So then fast forward to like the mid 2000s, and uh, this is pretty. It's funny because actually it kind of ties into the movie a little bit. But they wanted to um, do. They were there was a TV show called uh, America's Most Wanted, where um, they would like show the case of like different fugitives, pretty much put their picture on screen, and then hope that somebody would recognize them and report them pretty much. Are you sure that wasn't Unsolved Mysteries? Because that was a show I watched. That was a good show too. But no, America's <laughs> Most Wanted was a show very much like that. Okay. So they only had a picture of this dude from back then in the 80s, in the 2000s. So they got um they got an, an artist to be like, hey, an artist and maybe help from somebody to be like, hey, this is what he looked like in the 80s. Can you try to like draw a picture of what you think he might look like 20 years older? So they did just that and put it on TV and he had set up a new life. He was living a different life in the suburbia and like his neighbor recognized him and report him. So, um, hold on one second. My battery's dying for some reason. There we go. Okay. Always have it plugged in, man. It was, it was coming loose for some reason. All right. I'll push it back in. So, um, okay. So, so his neighbor reports him and he finally gets caught. And spends the rest of his life in prison in the 2000s. And he's he he died in prison a couple years back, apparently. So, but uh, yeah, at the time they made this movie, this is a real case with this dude still on the loose. Now they added in all the other stuff with him being a stepfather, with him doing it over and over again. But that was the basis was a serial killer named, uh, or I mean, not serial killer, but a killer called John List. So that's pretty interesting. Huh. Now, the reason why I bring it up as ties to the movie a little bit is that, is that the idea of like uh, in the movie, dude's like, hey, can you? can you post this picture in the article so that somebody may recognize them in a way that happened actually in real life in the two thousands, they put it on TV and the neighbor recognized them and reported them. So it, it's kind of funny. It's kind of the movie predict, predicts it a little bit. So. No, All right. Do you yeah. want to get into the, get into this movie? Yep. So since we already talked about the opening, let's go ahead and just cut to one year later, which makes sense since we went through even more backstory after we talked about the scene. Well, listen, this dude's a smooth operator for within one year for him to have married into a different family. Um, already they're already married her, already ingratiated himself into the family. 
they're already living together. It's like one year later, this dude he went to work quick, man. Oh, I'm just trying. There. I'm just trying to wonder. I, I mean, I know I'm an ugly fuck myself, but uh, is this guy really that good looking to <laughs> be able to meet and marry this woman in less than a year? It's so funny because when you think about it, when you're casting the role, do you actually factor that in? You're like, okay, we need a guy who can be like somewhat psychotic, but also play like happy go lucky, typical like suburban dad. But then do you factor an idea? But also, like, he has to be kind of a ladies' man because <laughs> he's repeatedly now been able to lure a woman into marrying him and like, and tr- like trusting him. So it's kind of like, it's a hard, that's a hard role to cast. I think. I'm, I'm not going to judge his looks. I'm just going to say that his personality is like so kind of charismatic, charismatic and friendly where you could see maybe where he was able to lure her, lure her in, you know? Well, I guess the other thing that makes it easier for him is his targets are women who's recently lost their husband or got divorced. So they're in a vulnerable well, state when he meets them. They're in a vulnerable state. He probably knows exactly what to say to, so um, in the sequel part two, you actually get to see more of his process of him actually meeting the the family, the girl, what he says. So they kind of you kind of see that process in part two play out right here. We already we already skip ahead to him they already being there. <laughs> um, and now uh, we can establish. So this was her house, and he moved in. Yes, that itself is kind of weird because then it's like uh, now he took over. Yeah, now it's like he's treating like it's his house, but it's like if they already had the house, it's also kind of like, like you're moving into a house where you're like, well, this is really the, the wife and the, the husband's house beforehand. Well, so, here's the question: Did he put his name on the lease? Knowing what we know about him, I don't think he can afford to do. I think he wants as small of a paper trail as possible, right? So he doesn't want to be throwing out this fake name, putting on paperwork, stuff like that. And okay, so let's go back to the previous house from the beginning. So that one, you asked the same question: Was his name on the house? It's like probably not because he's probably not. He probably doesn't have the proper identification to actually qualify for a loan because it's a fake identity. And then, is he just walking away from houses that he owns? It just I, I don't I don't think so. Well, you bring up he can't. He may not be able to get a loan because of fake identity. But here's the thing: he's getting jobs, <laughs> well yeah. paying jobs at that. So I don't think you know, a fake identity is going to be an issue for him. You know, it's a different time period. Maybe the 80s was like this, but, <laughs> you know, people right now probably would love this. You just, you walk in, you schmooze the the, the owner of the small business, and he just gives you a job on the spot right there. He didn't fill out applications, walked in, like made a conversation with the boss, and the dude's like, oh, this is this is perfect. You could start on Monday. Maybe it was that simple in the 80s. Like <laughs> it wasn't like, all right. Go for four forms of ID, drug test, all that stuff. Maybe that wasn't the case back then because I don't know. Probably not. I mean, because when I when I became 16 and was looking for a job, uh, every job said you got to fill out an application online, all that. And my dad's just like, no, you go in there and you talk to people. It's like, you do know the form yeah. says don't go in and talk to them. And, you know, there is a thing going on that if you did, do that go in and talk to someone they put you as unhirable because you failed to follow clear directions so maybe our parents their parents all that maybe their generation was really just like go in and talk you went and talked like the the manager the boss is already in the office you go just talk to them make a good impression and then you get the job but yeah right yeah now it'd be like nope don't come in here and try to schmooze us like do everything (laughs) online so um you smooth so, yeah. after you get the job. <laughs> and if you already smooth them, maybe then they're not like they're not really looking at your idea that hard. Maybe they're not like, hmm, well. And the eighties, how much what were the back were the real background checks? Like, you know, I, I don't know. So maybe he's just getting away with like the, the lack of technology. Maybe that couldn't be done today, what he's doing here. So um oh well anyway, so yeah, um, I wouldn't be able to <laughs> today. So we meet uh, we meet the family, which is basically Stephanie, our our main girl, and then the mom. And um, we can tell by their 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 battle of the leaves that Stephanie and their mom have a pretty good, strong mother daughter relationship. It's very hard to establish that with one scene, but just in one scene, you kind of get a feel for the relationship. It does a good job of just immediately being like, she loves her mom. They're super cool. 
But then the friction is that, oh, Jerry's home. <laughs> and you can see Stephanie immediately be like, freaking Jerry, man. Well, the, the, I mean, it, it's a little bit more prevalent in the and later in the movie, but you can definitely see where Susan is taking more Jerry's side and everything. Well, the relationship's so new that she's still in that that honeymoon, like... He can do no wrong type phase. Like, madly in love, kind of passion is still there. It's the first year. We Okay, we have to assume that maybe like maybe they just got married. So it's not like... I mean, unless he worked really quickly and got married immediately. Maybe they were engaged for like six months, they're married now. But yeah, they're still in the honeymoon phase. They're still You can see the passion there. They're still being very romantic towards each other. This is all like yucky to Stephanie, who's like still probably processing the loss of her uh-huh. real dad who died. Yes. Um, which is obviously more traumatic than him divorcing. If he's divorced, then you can still have a relationship with your dad, but he's just gone. Um, so she, but then in this first scene we see with them together, he buys her a dog, um, which is probably a good way to try to, you know, get over with the daughter. Um, but she still don't like him. Well, which we get which we get that well, from her psychologist. But 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 there's a line he gives. I want to give an example of him being awkward though. He gives the dog and like she's okay. It sounds like she's okay with it basically. But then he he pats her on the shoulder and he says, "That's my girl." It's just that sounds like something a father would say. But it's like, dude, I've met you. I've known you for a year. That's my girl. It's just awkward. So she she cringes at it. And I'm like, yes, that's. Yes, you would cringe at that. So now now I'm going to bring up something that you brought up to me because you watched the remake. I haven't. But you brought something up to me that the remake has a son instead of a daughter. Now, it, now whereas I can see where the only way a son-stepfather kind of dynamic would work is if the father was stronger than the son. But in this case, it is a young girl, and she doesn't know this guy all that well. He is creepy that she and she's mentioned that, I guess, to her therapist plenty of times that he's even bringing it up. Mm -hmm. And he and for some reason, even though the movie, I don't think meant to take it this way. Yeah, it does feel like he's getting some kind of weird attraction to her. So I didn't pick up on that. It's interesting because that that might be there a little bit. I would say that. So one thing to go back to your point about the remake, I'll address that first. It is uh it's a son, but it's also like it's like a a 17, 18 year old son who's like a swim team athlete and looks like he could probably beat up the father. So part of the dynamic here is that you have a young girl and the wife, and you already know we know he's crazy. So you're like, okay, whenever he snaps, he can overpower them and just kill them. Like it's no, yeah, we just already that's you need that threat kind of built in. If it's like a, a, there's another man in the house, then it's kind of like, all right, he snaps, but then the other guy just kicks his ass and that, that's it. <laughs> um, so that the remake did that wrong, I think. Um, in terms of him having any Again, kind of it, physical attraction, the only the only reason I, I I think it's not there is because it looks like his whole thing is like he's like obsessed with the the American dream, the the traditional family unit. The the wife, the daughter, the white picket fence, the the dinner table, like the traditional family thing. Basically, he's obsessed with trying to get that. So it's like, unless he's aiming to be a West Virginian, <laughs> uh, wrong turn. Uh, well, he's have, not related to either of them. <laughs> I, I I don't I don't know. I just think uh, like uh. I think that would actually corrupt his morals to be like, look at her that way. I think it's more just like he wants her to be like the perfect daughter and him be the perfect father or something. So, I mean, I got like I said, I don't think the director's meant for it to come off, but for some reason, there are just some scenes where it's like, yeah, that's a little creepy to be saying to a 16 year old who is not actually your daughter, dude. Yeah, I, I, I think it actually plays better. Um, if you think about that, it makes it, it does make it even more creepy to be honest. Um, but uh, but I don't know. It's like um, it looks like he's trying to be father of the year, have the family of the year, and then if it doesn't work out, just kill them and start over again until he gets out of work. Um, but yeah, who knows? So 
but you can definitely tell Jerry is now starting to slip when his uh slip his mask a little bit when he's talking to this one family he's trying to sell a house to because he's talking to a little girl. He mentioned Stephanie, and then he jumps to Jill. Now the funny thing about that is the actress who plays Stephanie, her real name is Jill. That- <laughs> so, so it plays on a different level, but that's the actual actress's name. So which I'm so, sure is intentional. <laughs> so so you think it maybe then it was just actually the actor messing up his line a little bit and the little girl's like, Who's Jill? I was like, Oh shit, <laughs> that's right, I'm still acting. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is that definitely was- this is definitely planned. They just said for fun, let's make it her actual real name. Because but, but this is really good acting because he's like you know, people are like deep in thought pretty much. Their eyes don't move. They just look ahead. Yeah. You know, like he does that thing where it's like, he's just looking ahead. His eyes aren't moving and he's talking still, but he's like lost his own thoughts. Um, he so is it really possible that, that so. is it possible that this Jill was maybe his actual daughter, his first family that he brutally murdered? Or I, you I think, think Jill was probably a little girl from the opening. I think it's worth asking. Has he ever, has he ever actually had a real daughter? We don't know. Maybe it's all been step families. Like, I, mean, I don't I feel, know. I feel like it, j- him randomly mentioning a random character's name. It's tells me he at least had a lot more of an affection for that character or that person than I he would have Stephanie. I just assume Jill was the dead girl on the floor from the beginning. Is what I assume. Possible again. It could also be his daughter that he just hasn't fully let go of yet, even though he's probably the one who killed her. So the original script had flashbacks and more background about him. And the director, I believe thought it works better without knowing his background. Like, let's not give it an explanation. Let's leave it up to people's imagination and be like, Oh, how was this dude raised? But originally the original script had like more flashbacks and more like giving him, more of a direct motivation, but they felt like it works better just leaving that as a blank, which so I have to I, be like, it's, it's interesting. Like, I don't think I need to see like his childhood flashbacks something like that. So, no, nah, so, and usually I've, I've said this with Nightmare on Elm Street, and I think I said it with Friday the 13th. When it comes to the very first movie, you only really need one motivation on why we should not trust this character or not mm-hmm. like the character. It's if you decide to make sequels, then you give us a little bit more of his backstory each movie. Because if you spoon feed it to us and then you decide to make a sequel, well, what can we learn about the character that's going to keep him fresh? <laughs> Unless you're the the Jeepers Creeper series where you never get any background. No matter how many sequels you do, you basically always just know and what then you re- And then you reboot it, hoping, hoping it kills the franchise so no one ever asks for it again. And you pretty much do kill the franchise. I think that series is Dunsky. Um Yeah, I, I think I think in this first movie, we just, that opening scene and just having the idea of this is what he's doing, that's all we need. I don't need to know that Jerry had a traumatic childhood. I don't need to know. Which we do get something about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, again, again, the movie does well at giving us enough to know we should not trust the character. We should not like the character besides just the opening. But it's when this it's in the sequels and when we want to learn at least one more thing about him. So because we already know from the opening, we already know what he is. The fun of the movie is just like uh, Stephanie figuring it out. Yes. Slowly. Like what clues is he giving her for her to pick up on and, and figure it out. So throughout the movie, little things happen where she started getting, she's already at the beginning smart enough to like, feel like something's off with them. Like when she's talking to the, um, her counselor the first time, she's kind of like, you know, I just don't like him basically. And he's the reason for whatever. And my mom, she said, my mom doesn't see it, but again, you can play off. It's just like, she doesn't like him because of the typical, he's not my real dad, you know, blah, we don't need him. But I already pick up on the idea that she thinks he's like creepy um and doesn't like him right um so she already has like some intuition about that but she just doesn't know exactly what 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 he is she doesn't know like she can't say he's a killer or nothing like that but she thinks something's off um well before we get to that we have to at least introduce one more character that pisses me off his name is jim i when did when did friday four come out again yeah, I was I was almost gonna 
<laughs> save Jim for a whole separate like discussion, but we can we could talk about his opening his opening thing here because um he comes in I guess with the reporter that reported <laughs> that was reporting on the case from a Ex- year ago. Explain this to me because <laughs> they pull up to a house and it almost feels like they're this is their first time meeting. I'm like, how do you get this guy in the car then to like drive him somewhere? Like he's like explaining like who are you? Like I'm the, I'm the brother. This happened here. I'm just like. <clears throat> How did they get here though? Like how? It was almost like it's almost <laughs> like an awkward thing because I'm like, this makes more sense about like him coming to the, the place where the newspaper is, right? And then like asking for him and then meeting and talking to him, then pulling up to the house is like I'm like, how do you convince this dude to get in the car and drive somewhere? Like, hey, come with me on this ride. I'm gonna explain something <laughs> to you. Like I don't. It's an awkward kind of thing, but um. I mean, are we sure they haven't met before? Because I feel like they would have had to have met. During the actual case was going on. No, because he's like, if that was the case, he introduced himself. He's like, he doesn't know he's the he's the brother until the, he tells him. Otherwise, uh, he would know he's the brother. So, so basically, with Jim, uh, the, the idea is Jim's been in Europe. He's been bumming around in Europe for a long time. So he just found out um, about this whole thing. Basically, he's come back in a town. He he actually inherited the house, which is creepy because everybody died there. Um, well, it's it's now Michael Myers' house. It's completely boarded up. No one's lit, been in there for years. I'm surprised that house hadn't been foreclosed on because who's paying for that house? So maybe the house is already paid off. I, I don't know. The fact you that Jim had to inher- pay those personal property taxes. Yeah, Jim inheriting it tells me that probably it's paid off. But then, yeah, he's gonna have to either sell got it. A lot or- of backlog. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> that's true. Because guess um, what? Guess what happens if you don't pay your personal property taxes? You can actually get in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. You, they, they can still take your damn house away. Jesus. Um, all right. We'll oh, talk about, we'll talk, we'll talk about Jim Moore as the movie goes on, but let's just establish right now. Yes. Somebody was, what somebody was watching final chapter and wrote this storyline in there. <laughs> this is not a coincidence that this is exact replica of, um, Rob from final chapter. <laughs> right. 13. So somebody was watching that clearly. Um, because the guy also kind of looks like Rob a little bit too. Looks like Rob, and then it's kind of like just not as beefy. Listen, we'll we'll, we'll talk a lot about it, but this is going to be our we have our main plot line, and this is the we'll call it so, the B plot line. Yeah, this is like almost like a different movie taking place in a different world that hopefully will some connect at some point in the movie. We'll we'll get that later though. Um, okay, so Jill gets into a fight. Stephanie. That's me. You got look. You got me calling Wait, 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 wait. Which, <laughs> who, who am I here? <laughs> uh, all right. Stephanie gets into a fight. Now, it gets expelled. It, now, one quite one thought I had was, um, she did it did on she, purpose. Did she get expelled on purpose? Because she's so suspicious of the dude that she's like, "Hey, I'd rather go to boarding school than be around this guy." So, what was this on purpose? Yeah, the, there's a slight problem. Uh, granted, her character's 16, so she doesn't really know much much better. But uh, with the way the mother is acting, mm-hmm. she wasn't going to boarding school, whether no matter what happened. <laughs> well, she says in the movie, and I believe her, she says she could probably convince the mom. The problem is um, Jerry steps in and is like, I don't, I mean, again. Uh, Jerry has line. no say. Think about this line. Um, he says, he says, <laughs> I don't think we need to break up the family pumpkin. Who says that as a stepfather that's only known her for like a year? I don't think we need to break up the family pumpkin. Well, here, here's, the, here's the thing. He has no say. The mom does. All She doesn't need to convince Jerry. She just needs to convince the mom. Yeah, mom but you're is the only one who can give her... Wait, wait. You're, you're forgetting that there's a scene where they actually decide. And how they decide, Jerry says, he says... Father knows best. <laughs> and then the discussion ends. He says, Father knows best. And they stopped talking about it. They just made the decision. Jerry just well, said, yeah, but Father knows best. And that was it. So. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not forgetting that. But when her sitting there thinking she has to convince both of them, no, you don't. You just need to convince the mom. And you need to make the mom stick to that plan, which eventually is going to get you both killed in the long run because then he would just kill you faster. But yeah, she I mean, don't know that. Better <laughs> for her that the mom is on with Jerry, though, because... If if they sent her to boarding school, then yes, Jerry would just reenact his plan quicker, and they'd both probably be dead. Um, she'd have to talk with the mom separately. You can't talk to the mom with Jerry there. Yeah, he's gonna jump. He's gonna jump in with 
Father knows best. Well, uh, again, bad she tried to do it again, and then Jerry just barged right into her room. It's like, dude, the girl's 16. Not. <laughs> again, like, um, the stuff he says to her, you immediately buy why she's like, anybody be like, who talks this way? Like, you're not my father. Why are you saying, calling me pumpkin and saying father knows best and that's my girl? All these, like, things he's saying is, like, big red flags to me. I mean, I'm, um, I'm, it's probably because I'm Southern, but I probably would have used the word darling. Oh, I mean, to talk to, <laughs> for your for your daughter, <laughs> it's like, I, I guess her, your stepdaughter. But again, it, it, granted, darling is more it, it can be seen as as a form of endearment, but not also so raw, so weird that it just kicks everyone out of it. Pumpkin, yeah. on the other hand, like you eat pumpkins, though you don't eat darlings. <laughs> I mean, pumpkin, that's probably something that was used a lot, like, in the 80s, I feel like. That was something probably oh, people yeah. said. But, but again, I don't think a stepfather would ever use that for, like, a stepdaughter. Um, One note about, I'm afraid about um with Jim meeting with the reporter earlier on. This gives us more background on Jim, like, tells him, basically, that, hey, every day for a couple weeks before the, the murder, he would get up and go to work like normal and then come back at night. And he says, from his theory, I think that he was setting up a new life here in those three weeks. And he pulls out a map and he says, how far can you drive and get back in one day? The question that comes to mind is, how did Jim know this? How the hell does, yeah, okay. <laughs> he, he got up and went to work every day and came back. If all the family's dead, who was alive to report that information? Who was the one to be like, oh yeah, he, he got up and like, he killed all the family members. How does and you're in Europe. Uh, even the cops, how would the cops even know? Like, I, so uh, I was like, wait a minute, Jim, how the hell do you know this? How does anybody know that he got up and went to work each day? Um, so it's good for the audience to get this information, but you're kind of like, how the hell do you know that? How do we know? Like, the only ones that would know that are the people in the household, and they're all dead. So well, I don't understand. Well, it's the Rob theory again. We're, we're getting Rob all over again, because how did he know his sister was murdered after only being gone for two days? They know that Jerry, or at that time, I guess he was Henry, they know that he quit his job a few weeks before the murders. So they know that they quit his job, but they don't know like if he just stayed at home after quitting his job and or if the wife knew about it. They're just assuming he quit his job, but then went to work. Um, but let's somehow he knows information, so then the theory actually makes sense. You wonder why the cops didn't pick up on this. Like, yeah, maybe he did set up a new life, and then he's somewhere within this driving distance. Um, but the problem is the cops don't care. So he, he told the cops, I guess, and they just, they don't care. So, so what um, I'm hearing is he wooed Susan for three weeks before killing the other family. When he asked her to marry her after that third week and she said yes, that's when he killed that family. I mean, maybe he did meet Susan while he was, because the thing, the, the, the two things are he was definitely setting up a new job at the, the new place. Yes. Um. So there was that. So maybe, yeah, maybe he met Susan because... He was never going to move somewhere and buy his own house, so he had to probably live in a hotel until he found a woman to let him move in. So you imagine him going there, getting a hotel, getting a job, meeting her at the grocery store or something, and then wooing her, I guess. So, yep. um, Well, okay. Um, now, um, and and again, his plan, Jim is, just wants from the porter to post a new story with the picture there and again that plays into what i was talking about eventually in the, two, the 2000s the real killer would be uh caught based on that sort of um well uh, tell me when was the last time you were at a pick uh, at, at a family barbecue <sighs> not like this now what do you have like this like th this kind of makes you miss not miss but i mean this is like suburbia perfectly you have neighborhood families all coming over with their families and they're all in the backyard and i don't think that kind of thing people are less neighborly in general now but i don't people do that kind of thing anymore nope. right people are well, more to uh, themselves they stay in the house two two reasons um covid for one uh video games for another because let's face it all the adults nowadays is people like us who grew up playing video games watching movies so when we get to be in that age, age to be able to go out and actually have the money to do these cookouts, like I don't want to do that. 
I just want to sit here, relax, and be me. I don't know. I, I think that I, I agree with your point. People are more inside. They're on the internet. They're doing their own thing. But some of it is just that, like I said, you don't, people don't, yeah, people don't establish those relationships with their neighbors anymore. There's not like a feeling of community. Like, I don't think you'd ever have like a, a neighbor where all the families get together anymore and like do a, a big thing like that. It could be fun for the kids more so than the adults, I think, just to play with other kids and stuff. Um, but yeah, because because again, I doubt we're gonna have any kind of any more communities where something happens. Some someone in the community, let's say, was murdered. So, you, and you see, you actually hear about some things, or you see something happen where, when the neighborhood found out who did it, they didn't call the cops. <laughs> The neighborhood itself took care of it. You're not going to get that anymore. Now, this is unique also because this is actually, this is all the families that he sold houses to. Yes. So he gives a speech about, hey, you guys are the ones that sold houses to. Uh, so, you know, it's been a, I think he says it's like been a year, maybe not. But um, yeah, so he's there to celebrate. But unfortunately, in the middle of this uh, fine gathering of folks, he's privy to a article that Jim had just talked about, which is the reposting of the murders from the other town, which one Jerry Blake, of course, was involved in. And he reacts. But you know what my reaction was? Where's the picture? The whole purpose of this was to have the picture, reporter guy. You had one <laughs> job was to have the picture. What is the purpose without the picture, reporter guy? He's lucky he even got the article out. Can you imagine when Jim first opened the news? He was like, oh, shh. What? Jim was like, "Where's the picture, man? Like, <laughs> like, I don't like. Literally, like, what, what is, what is this gonna do for anybody without the picture? I don't. Right, because if it, because if it was, uh, if there was a picture, you know, granted, the movie would have been over right then and there because all those dudes, somebody right there would have been like, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he would have been outnumbered by all the dads there. So he got so right here. Jerry gets very lucky that the editor decided." stupidly not to post the picture um but I, I guess so one thing it does though is by posting the article because stephanie is going to come back and look at the article and that does at least set her on a trail so there was a little bit of a purpose within the movie because now she's like hey i'm going to request the picture from the, the place now this place who didn't want to publish the picture was me Sensitive. perfectly fine Perfectly fine just sending the picture. Oh, you want the picture? Let's send it to you. Like, what? <laughs> we don't want it in our records no more. Um, so she now is like kind of like, oh, also something happens too, where she the article sends Jerry into a tailspin where he goes down to his, his workshop basement and does that thing where he's talking to himself and going crazy. But yep. Steffi actually sees it. Yes. So she's like, she's putting the, together the article with that, and she's like, oh. My stepfather's a killer. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Because I, I kind of wrote something down that he says during that rant. Why won't they leave me alone? Boy, don't kill the families that you're married to. <laughs> All I did was <laughs> kill my... I butchered the family. Why won't they leave me alone? <laughs> ah, naive, like if Jerry. You, if you're not happy with the family you're with, you divorce them, get to a new family. You'd be a, You'll be seen as a jackass, of course, but... You won't be a murderous jackass. Oh, man. Well, Is it, uh, uh, until, you know, at least with this movie, the only context we get is he marries into families that seems to have a mother and a daughter or two daughters. Because mm -hmm. I don't know who the third person he killed in the op in the opening was. I'm guessing a teenage daughter. But yeah, uh, go, back, go back and see all the bodies. But, yeah. but either way, we so we get three. So we get three girls that he killed there, and now we get uh, another girl, woman, and a daughter. Is he just afraid of going up against a go to find a family with a teenage son that will probably beat his ass? I I think like he he kind of knows that hey like if if there's any potential that I'm gonna have to like get rid of them, then it just works better if it's all um, women in the household. If there's any like son who can like push back now interesting enough in the sequel there is a a son but he's too but young he's too young to really yeah so it was going to be young son or daughters it was not going to be a someone who could fight son, him which is what they did randomly in the remake which again is like 
why would you do that? But um, so anyway, she um, they send her the picture, but Jerry's here to intercept the mail. And that was the one flaw in her plan was like, you got to really be checking the mail every day and get to the mail before Jerry does. Now, oddly enough, though, when she gets home, so that there's a couple things about the scene. It's played very well because he gets it. And then his facial expression when he sees the picture is like, he's like, <laughs> like, he looks like just like, oh, sh he's like, damn it. Now I got to kill these two. <laughs> so she pulls up right behind him and he acts quickly and like just covers for it and gives her the magazine. But the thing is, he actually says, like, she's like, you're home early. And he's like, yeah. So he happened to come home early that day. Otherwise, she was about to get the mail. And again, this whole thing would have been set off. But she should have known also, like, if they're going to send it to me, I have to make sure that he doesn't see it first. Because now he knows that she knows. And now well, he's like, you know. Well, you know what's bad about this is she had no reason not to have gotten it. You know why? She had no school to go to. Where did she go? She could oh, but went, no, no, no. Well, no, 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 no. She. This was smart though. The scene before this was her seeing. She was still seeing the counselor. So yeah. the scene, scene right before this is her meeting with the counselor, and she's and the counselor tells her, "Hey, I'll call your father or stepfather. I'll call him and try to convince him about the boarding school thing." So they actually play that she's coming back home from that. If she didn't have that meeting with him, she would have been at home and maybe got it, got to the mail before him. But he does a very he does a very brilliant thing, which is he has it re come back to her with a new picture uh, inside. Yeah, that was, really, that was really that was really that was really smart on his part. Honestly, I'll, I'll say this: if I'm expecting something that is going that could potentially be incriminating to a guy I don't trust, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Staying home, waiting Shh. to get that mail. She also was doing a thing, I think, where she was like, okay, he normally comes home from work at this time every day. So when she comes home, she's like, you're home early. So she's surprised that he's there. So she was probably calculating also what time he gets home. But he has a type of job where it probably is unpredictable. Um, well, it is because he has no no clients to go see it, show a house to. He can do anything at his home. He doesn't what need do you, to be in the office. What would you think about the picture he replaced it with? <laughs> it's just like he's like, oh, this guy looks like a killer. <laughs> Some like random dude, like <laughs> with a really the, thick like freaking mustache. Even the picture of Jerry is just funny. <laughs> it's him like fully bearded, but he's giving like a goofy, a goofy facial expression. Um, well, this is smart because this makes her be like, oh, well, I was wrong. It's not him. Um, now, um, the therapist. Um, yeah when jerry guy. jerry doesn't take the phone call so the therapist says okay i'm gonna arrange me to see a house and he'll show me the house i as i was watching it i, I kept thinking to myself i was like okay he genuinely does care about stephanie he's going the extra mile here but i was like i made a note of like doing too much like yeah, yeah. and then he does he doesn't really pull it off when he this scene's funny because he's like, so Jerry's playing someone fake. He's playing someone fake. So they're both not being the real identity. And they're both trying to hide things from each other. Well, I, I, I'm just thinking to myself, like, you could have actually played it off of where this therapist could have been a kind of a major point for this movie by having him realize that Jerry's not who he says, so he starts investigating too. But granted, granted, then the movie probably would get in a little bit easier for Stephanie because ultimately no, they, they, we need the, they, Stephanie and Jerry to go to go at it. They want basically slowly the people that you think could protect Stephanie slowly get eliminated pretty much. So the therapist is like, oh yeah, he's like a, a knight in shining armor here himself. But then, um, I mean, he seems like a smart guy. I don't understand why so quickly he forgets that he just told him that he doesn't have a family. Well, and then he says he's married. Like, well, the, the real question <laughs> is, the real question I got is, ultimately, he's not there to actually buy a house. He's there to talk to Jerry about getting Stephanie to boarding school. When they meet face-to-face, -face, before going inside, I would have been like, by the way, I'm actually the, you know, at least I'm still outside, so if Jerry tries to do something, I have a running start. No, see, like, <laughs> see, the thing is, like, he he did not want to reveal that. He wanted to basically just meet the guy and see, like, okay, 
Stephanie's acting like this dude is a, a demon. I just want to meet him, but I don't want to like. So one thing you'll notice is so basically after he messes up pretty much, gives away that he's there on the wrong mission, Jerry immediately kills him. Now, um, this death scene, even though it's not gory, it's really brutal. And I think it's because he's it, using a two by four to beat him to death. Yes. It's now, really like, it really feels brutal. It is. However, I got a question. So yeah. when it first starts, yeah, so there's a little, there's a bit of shock, but he's still defending himself, which means he has the func- he's putting the brain his, function. He's putting his arm up. So the first like five hits he takes to the arm, which yeah. is pretty realistic, but I think the you're next, getting the, the idea of like, when, when do you, when do you fight back though? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm thinking, okay, but at the same time, the therapist, sure, th- he's a therapist. He may he may become a therapist because therapist because he can't fight. I- he's probably not physically strong to do anything, or he's just that smart. Either way, dude, someone just beat you with a two by four, and then he wanted, and then he said a few words to you, and the time it took him to say the few words, the therapist should have tackled his ass to the ground. The therapist, unfortunately, yeah, I, I think um, if someone starts hitting you with a two by four, right, and you're like blocking the arm, right? Oh yeah, your arm broken, but you could still tackle them. But you're still probably going to try to fight back. Yeah, it, that that's what made it so brutal. Is like I was like, if he's going to come with a two by four, he's going to have to hit him a bunch of times. And he does, him. and he does, he does. And um, now, now the, the first hit to the head most likely stunned him to the point where. There's no getting out of that. Now, correct. Now, here's why I, uh, you would mention like you should have told him. Basically, you'll notice even as he's beating him, he's like, "Who are you?" The dude still to protect Stephanie. He still maintains that he's just there to see the house. He's not going to tell him because he knows that. Well, at oh, that, that point, he kind of has no choice. <laughs> yeah, but he could have like he could have like tried to reveal himself to beg off in a way to save his own life. But he still was like, "Okay, if I tell him, then." No matter what, he's going to be more suspicious of Stephanie. Then, so he still try to protect, try, or tries potentially to potentially kill Stephanie. So he still protects her, but protect yourself, dude. Fight back! Like <laughs> he's <laughs> he's going to hit you eleven times with a two by four. Like do something. Like yeah, I, I tackle. Agree. Like, you, right. This, this is not him like beating up like a little girl. This is like two grown men, and he and has like a two said, by four. But yeah, I mean, you can just tackle him. Yeah. Yeah, the therapist, it does look bigger to him, in my opinion. So if you tackle him, sure, your arms are broken, but at the same time, tackle him. Adrenaline does a lot to you. You probably He probably wouldn't have felt it. Grab the two-by-four and bashed him in the face with it. That's what I would have done. You know, after my arm being broken to shit. <laughs> <laughs> cut, to, cut, to, cut to Nick dead on the ground. <laughs> Just like... <laughs> In the exact same position. <laughs> He's like, man, I underestimate how much that broken arm affected me. Uh, but look, credit the movie. The, the therapist only had like three scenes, but again, better than most slashers, you do kind of care about the characters. So you're like, oh man, like that was really, that was really brutal for like what felt like a real person. So, well, um, it, it, yes and no, because I don't know, I don't go to therapy, but I don't know many therapists that put themselves in this kind of situation for a client he he he, he, i I, my my takeaway was like he put himself too into the situation um yeah he he should have just kept like meeting with her but he shouldn't have like went out of his way to meet the dude yeah and and then and then if he really felt like because the thing about a therapist is sure patient doctor confidentiality however if you feel like there somebody is in danger, then you have a legal right to say something. Her saying, I think he's dangerous, he did have a legal right to break that confidentiality to at least tell the police, hey, my client just said that she thinks your stepfather's dangerous. I'd like to get a check on him. Yeah, yeah. I... And then, again, if that damn picture would have posted, the police would, police would have seen him and were like, oh, shit, you're the killer. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like I said, I understand why the guy had to die. And then also the movie does a smart thing where Jerry uses his death to kind of bond with Stephanie. Yeah. She's grieving now, more vulnerable. So now he steps in as like the the comfort comforting shoulder to cry on. He hugs her. And suddenly for a few moments in the movie, they are like actually kind of cool with each other. 
Like she starts to be like, I've been too hard on Jerry. Can we start over? Um, now I want to come back to Jim's story for a few minutes because wait, Henry he, wasn't his real name. <laughs> uh, no. And the cops knew there was a pattern, meaning there are multiple murders of the same caliber. The fingerprints are untraceable, so they have no idea where to start. They're gonna. The cops' plan is to wait for him to do it again. So, sorry, Stephanie. They're, no one's coming to save you because the cops are waiting for it to happen to you, and then use that. Um, but um, want to hear the problem with that theory is um, the, the same thing the, would happen. The, again. Exactly. <laughs> would, if you can't trace his fingerprints now, what's gonna make you better do it next time? So right, there's uh, what you expecting somebody to call the cops the minute it's happening when. The previous times it obviously hasn't. So, also, unless you need to change your point of attack there, bud. Well, poor Jim is like literally like he's like if he the way he figures this whole thing out is like if the cops just did what he did, they would have found him. Like Jim himself, which doesn't seem like the most smartest person in the world, is like putting together the case basically and like and fi- ends up finding him. But the cops' advice to Jim doesn't seem kind of funny. He's like, "What would you do?" He's like. I'd buy a gun and blow him away. I'm like, huh? 80s. 80s. It just didn't fit. Like the I'd be like, um, so copper, like, what do you mean? Like, you just told me we can't find him. Like, and then you cut to Jim at the, the shooting range. I'm like, would a cop ever say that to a civilian? Like, get a gun and blow him away. Like, I, well, that's weird. In in the 80s, 70s, 60s, because there actually was a law at one point where civilians were allowed granted it was a fight it wasn't murder but were allowed to actually challenge each other to a duel to beat the living crap out of each other to get whatever frustrations is out of some states still have that so what's (laughs) funny is yeah it's funny is like they cut to jim at the uh the gun range so literally what the cop told him jim was like yeah good advice now now think about the movie if the cop tells him hey if you find him, call us. Now, Ford, we'll get to what happens at the end. Now, Ford, back to the idea of, like, oh, yeah, Jim, if you find him, call the cops. Now, we'll trace that scenario later on, but he really takes the cops advice, like, yeah, I'm going to blow him away. Like, oh, okay, Jim, we'll see how that goes. Well, um, all right. first, let, let, there is one other scene where he does try to get the local cops on his side because now, because when he did all that, he was still in the town that the first murders happened. So when he so then cut to the next when he, he finally finds, gets he finds to out Oak Ridge, that he, he finds out to the magazine basically that he guesses that this is the town where he went to. Yeah. So he tries to get the cops there involved and they told him to kick rocks. He doesn't he doesn't really get not exactly. He asked them for a listing of all the marriages in the last year. That is different than him coming and being like, hey, the killer, he's there at that house. It's a different response from the cops. What he's saying is he, when he first goes there, he's like, uh, yeah, I, I think I have an idea here. Can I get a listing of the marriages? And the dude's like, look, we got real stuff going on. Um, we'll come back in a few weeks. He even told him, I think there's a killer around here. No, no, I know. I'm, I'm, just, I'm saying we'll get to it later, but it's different than him coming in and be like, hey, he's there at that house. I'm going to go there with my gun. He's there. The actual killer is there. It's a different response to the cops. The cops are like, all right, just send up send a squad car over there. Uh, just he's saying the killers are send a squad car, but Jim is too set on the advice of like, yeah, find him and blow him away. Yeah. I'm gonna do it myself. All right, Jim, let's see how that goes. Um, but, um, all right, let's get back to, um, Stephanie now has a boyfriend. Stephanie has a boyfriend, which, um, again, they do a good job of like establishing their relationship in a couple of scenes throughout the movie to where I personally didn't uh, care for it, but either way, <laughs> well, it wasn't make to make you think that they're like a, a. It's not a big deal, but it's 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 tricky to get to the point where they kiss in front on the porch where Jerry can see it and lose his mind. It's a perfect trigger point for Jerry to be like, "Oh, this is not working out." She's sixteen. He has a funny response. He's like, "Yeah, so am I." <laughs> <laughs> I think he's thinking that like uh, Jerry thinks he's like a nineteen year old or something like that, taking advantage of his daughter. But he's like, "I'm sixteen too," and and he's then he trying tells, to rape her. It's like. No, I mean, you're telling me you don't remember when you were 16, not getting any girls, taking your first date, which was your probably your cousin, to your uncle's door and dropping her off, and you gave her a kiss then? Tell me you I'm don't remember that, that? I'm guessing Jerry at 16 thought all girls had the cooties. <laughs> so <laughs> it's probably a lot later on he was like, all right, this is the way I can have kids. All right, let's talk to this girl. Um, 
he he, he tells the he tells the um the wife he's like she's too young for that is like she's like to kiss a boy on the porch like i don't i don't know well the and the annoying part is is of course stephanie and jerry and really this would be a normal kind of interaction from a father embarrassing his daughter and mm-hmm. scaring her boyfriend is they're going back and forth back and forth stephanie finally tells susan like look he is not my dad he's not going to be and then susan slaps the shit out of stephanie i'm like and now you just made it away. Your daughter is going to tell you to go f- fudge yourself. Well, she runs away. Mm-hmm. And um, and this is the beginning of the end. Because now Jerry's crossover into full-blown, all right, plan B. Start a new life again in a different town. Quit my job. Start to go to the new town. So we see a little bit of the process here where he's like going on that boat again, getting a new job, meets a new woman. He's well, quite setting got... up that life again. So Yeah, but I got a question. So yeah. he wants this perfect family, right? Yeah. What was going to happen the minute Stephanie turned eighteen? Was he going to? What was? It was like, oh, we made it eighteen. Cool, you got to die now because now I don't have a family anymore. I, I think the long term plan. I'm guessing the long term plan would have made sense with him been to convince her to have another baby with him. Because you're right, she's going to turn 18 and probably go off to college. He's going to be like, we need more, we need, it's not a family without kids in the house, that's like his whole mindset, so he would have had to convince her to have a baby. Um, that's probably the long-term plan, I'm guessing. Um, but, you're right, who knows? I mean, no matter what, stephanie has got to be thinking like, hey, I just got to deal with this guy for two more years, he can't stop me from going to college unless he's like, you got to go to the college down the street and stay at home, so... Yeah, well, maybe. Uh, there is one thing I, we did. I did forget to mention because, yeah. you know, you brought up we don't get much about Jerry's past. However, while talking to the therapist, while showing the house, the therapist does say something to Jerry about him having a strict childhood, and Jerry said, "You could say that," mm. which is probably why his brain is the way it is. Yeah, but do you? Um... Here's my problem. Do you? Do you believe anything Jerry says, though? <laughs> I have a problem. Like, I think I always think he's just like kind of potentially lying with everything he says. Well, I feel yeah. like a pat, uh, some kind of past, like his childhood. I don't think he'd need to lie about that. Hmm. He would have to stress the truth a little so no one could eventually find it. But a vague statement like you had a strict childhood. Be honest. With the, be honest. But when he was a child, it was probably in the sixties. Yeah. So either he had a strict childhood or his parents were too high to give a shit about him, in which case he had a tough childhood. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. I'm happy with like them giving us little nuggets like that, but I'm glad they didn't go full-blown Rob Zombie's Halloween where we're cutting back <laughs> to him with his parents at the beginning as a flashback. Um, so um, Stephanie is going to go back to the therapist's office, find out that Jerry had met with the doctor, Yes, she's gonna go to the house. Um, now the actress uh, Jill, who played Stephanie, said that she. Now this is pretty interesting. There's a TV version of the movie apparently that has like a lot of added scenes in the TV version. Nobody can find it though, and then and the deleted scenes were not put on any of the Blu-ray or DVD releases. But the actress, she was like, she was like, there's this whole like extra ten minutes here of like her like doing more investigating. Um, She's like, when she shows up at the house at the end, you notice like her clothes are messed up. That's she's like, because things happen to where her clothes got messed up and stuff. But she said they cut it out for some reason. So we don't see a lot of the her investigation error. She even said that there's like a point in the movie where her and Jim are at the same place. They don't interact, but they just like, they cross each other pretty much. Hmm. And um, as just like a tease of like, they're at the same place, but they don't know each other yet. Um, but they, well, they're said they, never going to know each other. Well, they cut all that out. So, um, all right. So let's talk about, uh, <laughs> let's talk about Jerry finally snapping. Jerry comes home one day. The wife has found out that, that he, he quit his job, quit his job. Doesn't work there. He tries to cover it up. He's like, ah, oh, that new receptionist. He's going to, for some reason she said she accepts that, but then he's still calling the place to yell at somebody, which makes no so, sense. He, and then she, accepted, he, she bought the lie already. Why are you calling? And then all of a sudden it's, God damn it, this is Hopkins. It's like, Hopkins? 
<laughs> now, Wait, who am I here? Researching online, I found out that this is like the um, the iconic line or scene of the movie. Him just being like, "Who am I here?" That's what everybody remembers about this movie is that look he gives and that, and then him just turning around and just just like pistol whipping gone. her with a damn phone. So violent, my he hits her so hard with the phone. I know they don't show it, but he like. I'm like, my God. And then well, like, he did have to knock her out so that way we can get this cat and mouse with him and Stephanie, which uh well, you she, said she wanted to wait, wait, he he doesn't just knock her out, he throws her down the stairs. She basically should be have a broken neck and probably be dead based on what happens to her, but we'll say she's just knocked out unconscious. Um we need a happy right. ending somewhere. This stuff anything. Do we want to talk about this awkward nude? Scene. Uh yeah, director. Just because your actress is twenty one, don't uh, unless it fits the story. You don't need her to be naked. Just saying. Yeah. So I will. Um, I'll read. You said quote. you had some background. So, well, the most cliche thing you think about the idea is that the eighties always had nude scenes. So it's just like a token nude scene that they felt like eighties horror movies had to have. But the um. The actress, I'll, I'll give you her sort of perspective on it because she does comment on it. Um, hold on, let me grab the quote from. Oh, her. so that's even worse than it's the actual actress. It wasn't like a body double because they didn't have the money for a body double. <coughs> well, yeah, I mean, she was the, the she was of the age where she could do it, but um, obviously the character is sixteen, which makes it yeah, of which, which make yeah, that that's um, why it's like if you wanted okay. to do that, make the character eighteen. So it says, uh, Jill Shulin said she wasn't comfortable doing the nude shower scene. I really wasn't, and that was the only movie in which I am naked. I remember talking to the director about it, and he explained why it was important, and I realized it wasn't about the sex. I mean, it may have been for the people who like that kind of thing, but it makes it much more frightening that she's there with nothing on, innocent as can be, taking a shower, and has no idea that this man has basically killed her mother or beaten her, and he's sitting there with a knife he's about to go after. That's kind of how the director explained it. Like, basically, it's going to make you look more vulnerable, vulnerable, if you happen to be taking a shower, but you could have showed her taking a shower and not actually had the nudity though. So that, there's um, that. Uh, you want to know another, an, an, another thing they could have done. Yeah. Just not have her take a shower. She's already a vulnerable person. Considering in fact, she is a young character versus a deranged adult male with a knife. Now it brings up an interesting point though, because we are talking about, is there like a, uh, a underlying surface of like, him like creeping on her in that way, uh, Jerry. And I, I think it's almost like his, uh, conservative sort of family values thing was like, I'm going to let her finish taking the shower and then kill her because she's my daughter. I don't want to see her naked. I think that might've been a play at there. that I point. Sure. I mean, he was, he already snapped at that point. I don't think he would have cared if she was naked or not. The only reason he didn't attack her while she was in the shower is because that's when Jim decided to stupidly walk in and, I'm sorry, Jim. Well, looks like well, someone who could, should be able to defend himself. Well, I mean, this is the most egregious thing about the movie. This is like, um, this is Rob. I mean, death. this is Rob. This is worse than Rob. <laughs> it's worse than Rob because um, Rob can't fight Jason hand to hand. I don't even think Rob's story was built up as much as this one has. This is the entire B plot line. <laughs> um, so much so that they keep cutting to him driving to the house, like, like, and they have like. They have like music going, like chase music, as if like, oh my god, yeah, he, ha he has to get to the house before Stephanie's in trouble. So he gets there, and then it's okay. <laughs> what what actually happens here? He rings the doorbell. Jerry comes down. Op uh, Jerry doesn't open the door. He's hiding by the no. door. So, okay, Jim so um, walks in. Jim walks Jim's in. Like he's walking in now. If you're gonna walk in, your gun's in your pocket, I guess, right? Yeah, he never. Un so that's the first issue. You're walking into a known dangerous place. Pull your gun out. But walk in with when cops enter a mysterious scene, they they walk in with the gun. Yes, that would have actually probably saved his life. Now the gun's the thing. Now he has another chance though because Jerry doesn't full blown surprise him. Jerry closes the door, allows him to turn around, and then says, "Hey, Jim, I recognize you." And Jim's response is, "There's." Blood on your face, Jim. No, what the hell again, are you doing, man? What are you so, doing? I don't understand. I'm guessing, I'm guessing Jim hasn't been in a lot of fights. 
Because, uh, you know, usually at the end of a fight, there's at least one person that has blood somewhere. Jim, but, wait, um, wait, wait. But this makes more sense if Jim's walking in, like, just, like, completely blind. Jim, you already know he's the killer. Like, if it was Paul. Yeah, no, no, it's like, Jim, you know he's the killer. So you'd be like, blood. It's like, you already know. You're there because you know he's the killer. <laughs> so then they both pause for, like, five seconds, it feels like. And Jim's like, oh, wait a minute. I better reach for my gun now. <laughs> First of all, forget about reaching for a gun. Like, if he's going to lunge with a knife, first just defend that part first. <laughs> Why reach for the gun? Defend him attacking with a knife. You're a bigger, stronger dude. Allegedly. You have, you have all the advantage. You're a bigger, stronger dude coming in there with a gun. You have all the advantages in the actual fight here. You yeah. All the advantages. How do you how do you manage to, die, to get killed here? I don't understand. Even when he first stabs you, you could still fight back. I don't... It's just... um. It, it is the most frustrating thing I've ever seen. So, yeah, it's very bad writing what they should. If you really wanted to kill Jim off to take make Stephanie have to take care of this herself, let, stab him in the let back. Him, no, but let him um, let him sacrifice in a way where it actually helps Stephanie. Let there be at least a purpose to him dying. Right. You just made him come in like the biggest klutz in the world. And, like, <laughs> again, if you said they're both staying there, bigger, stronger dude has a gun in his pocket, whatever, dude has a knife. And the dude's gonna lunge at him, you would still be like, okay, he has a knife, he's bigger and stronger. There's gonna be a struggle here, 50 50 chance, whatever. He just like, there's no struggle at all. Like, I think even damn near Rob put up a better fight against Jason, even that, but wasn't much of a fight either. But man, it still, it still took at least like 10 hits on Rob and only one stab in, on uh, Jim. <laughs> And they do a weird thing with the music too, where like as he, every time he stabs him, the music goes like high pitched, like elevated and stuff. And it's just weird. It, it was the weird scene. I just wish that he would have stabbed him, left him alive, and then maybe he dies then, but let him like distract him at the end to help Stephanie or some purpose. Or maybe he's the one who shoots instead of the mom randomly showing up, have him the one to actually pull the trigger on Jerry, and then the girl stabs him. I mean, to have do there to avenge his sister's death and like just go out like so. St oh man, I'm like, it is like it is. Rob, just maybe I understand the Rob thing because you at least had you had Trish and you had Tom. You're like, okay, they're the main people basically. I almost I almost bought an idea that Jim was like the co co lead here, but he gets discarded like he's like a nothing basically. So, um, like I said, I know the purpose is again it has to be just him versus Stephanie. I get that. But man, don't build it up so much for that. It was just anticlimactic. <laughs> and then you even give a to to insult him more. You have a you have a, a Jerry give the funny one liner. He's like, "Next time you come, Jim, next time call before you come, Jim." <laughs> yeah. he, he hits he hits him with "I killed you." And now I'll give you a one liner thing. Like Jesus, <laughs> man. If I was the actor, I'd have been no, like, no. I'd have been like, "Yo," I was like, "Could this be a, a, a Dewey situation?" Like he stabbed me, but then like I'm at the end. You see me getting pulled out on the stretcher, and I get the thumbs up. Like, can it be a Dewey situation? Something? Well, I don't know. There is a Dewey situation. Mm. Oh well, yeah. So well, anyway, we get our cat. Let's get back to cat and mouse. Right. Yeah. yeah um, we get our cat so, and mouse where Stephanie gets so the, into the attic. Wait, wait, wait! Before we get that though, the um, this uh, this end sequence wasn't really scripted out. They had to kind of come up with this like thing basically it, the script might have been more like hey they get into a fight basically and eventually this happens but they were like okay Stephanie's in the bathroom and then they're like okay Jerry's knock on the door and um apparently the director actually said he's like wait a minute like if he if he actually gets in the room he's gonna kill her <laughs> we don't want that so <laughs> so uh somebody else on set was like makes perfect sense think, it's been but it's been done before since then probably, but it was like okay, put a mirror on the door so that he can break the glass, and then she, being relatively smart, it's gonna pick up a shard and like stab him when he comes. Stab him with it, yeah. Um, Which is what happens after he does his uh, Jason for he's barrel through the door. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> he's like ah, it's a great visual. Did the attic <laughs> thing? Did you see like? I was like oh crap when he puts his head up and she like sends a thing towards his head. It barely she. <laughs> That thing came fast, like it's about to take his head off. Well, he she barely, it. she did barely ducked it. out the way. <laughs> I don't know if like they planned it, but it looked like that was like very dangerous. Like he ducks out, but it looks like that would have literally took his head off. Probably. 
that that, that was her intention. <laughs> yeah. No, I, it was just filmed away. Where it was like, I was like, that looked dangerous for the actor. Even like, you gotta duck out the way before that thing killed him. So, yeah, um, well, he does he does do something stupid and not mind his steps. You better believe in a horror movie. You're walking on some kind of some kind of ground that's shaky that the killer is gonna fall through. <laughs> And that's I've seen that in so many so many movies. Now the problem is when he falls through, the person always assumes like, oh well, everything's okay now. <laughs> gone. Well, I don't um, think she really felt like that. She ran. She ran to the steps, saw Jim's dead body, kind of froze because of that, and then he jumped her. Uh, well, actually, he saw she saw her body. She saw Jim's body earlier. Actually, when she first when he first attacks her, she sees him then too. Mm. So. The mom is there actually to help shoot Jerry in the ass. <laughs> but, uh, um, well, shoulder first, then the side where like his uh, lungs would be. So he's kind of so it's hard to breathe. And then Stephanie gives the final stab to the chest, which legally should have killed him. It did kill him, and it, he does as his parting words. He do, he does say, "I love you," then falls back down the stairs, which is kind of a weird thing for him to say at that point. But, um. It had to end that way. It had to, he had, she had to be the one to kill him. Well, I'm and, fine with that, but uh, he's not he dead. dead. He is dead. <laughs> <laughs> she Step stabbed him in the two. heart. She stabbed Step him in the heart. Two. Oh my god! I so part two, which does not bring back the same director, does not bring back the same writer. The only thing you have is Terry L. Quinn coming back as a stepfather, but clearly because this ending of her cutting down the birdhouse. And her being happy with the mom. If they know Jerry's still out there, I, I assume they're moving out of that house, moving somewhere away. So they are, they definitely are assuming he's dead, in my opinion. Um, I know he has to come back in part two, but the movie works be better if he's dead here. I'm just saying. To be fair, the movie is called The Stepfather. We did not mm -hmm. need the same character for Stepfather 2. It just needed to be um, a stepfather. <laughs> yeah, but... One of the good things about the movie is the iconic performance of the actor they got to play him. You can't just, that's a hard casting role. You can't just get, it's like the Wishmaster thing. You can't just plug in a new Andrew Devoff. You got to find. You know what? I, I got one better for you because you bring that up, but I'm going to have to argue that Sleepaway Camp did it better. You know, you got your uh, iconic role by, what's her name? Felissa Rose. And then two and three is a different actress who, admittedly in my opinion is a better slasher than Velissa rose was yeah but the difference there is that so the girl in the first one i think is more of a almost like a child slash teen yeah and then the one the one two and three is definitely played more like an adult i would say yes so it, 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 but it's still fun. supposed to be the same character yeah but just a different age range so it's a little bit different i would say that with this one uh, look what you're saying basically i mean they um in a way, I mean, they didn't do a different character, but because the third one apparently is the same character, but apparently mm -hmm. it was just they were terrible, didn't work. Now, um, Terry O'Quinn, who went on to have a, a good career, he's a, he's mostly mostly known for the TV show Lost, apparently. Um, he, it's kind of weird. He doesn't really like the special features on the Blu-ray, right? They have a documentary where they do all the interviews and stuff, and they interview the cast and stuff. And apparently he like did not want to participate in any of the special features. He never really talks about the movie. I found one quote, which I'll read from him about the movie. He says, it was the first time I had that much work to do in a film. I got a taste of thinking I was important on the set. The guy was obviously psychotic. I just thought there were opportunities to be insane and try to act as normal as possible while being insane. And that was fun. But it didn't really launch me in any way. It made people call me up to play only psychotics. And I didn't want to just become that. So I stayed hungry for a good long while. My thing is, like, if he felt any negative way towards it, like, why did he come back for the sequel two years later? Um, well, but when, that's when did he, you said that was his thoughts on it. When did he say those thoughts? It could have been after doing part two. It, it is, yeah. The thoughts are more modern, but. So it's possible he didn't have those same thoughts after part one. Yeah, and then he did part two, and that's when he—that's when they try to typecast him, and he's like, "I don't want to keep playing the same character. That's not fun anymore." Yeah, I get it. It just, it just strikes me as like I—I I feel like um, I wonder now with like like there's a 4K release coming out now or a 4K release that's out now with 
new commentary tracks, which has like the actors, directors, and stuff like that. I'm just like, man, I, I would like to think he's actually proud of like his performance in the movie. It's like an icon. It's an iconic thing people know him for. Well, but it feels like it feels like he doesn't want to like um really have anything to do with it. So well, I will say it does. From what you told me, it does sound like he's proud of it because he said he had a lot of fun doing it. But it, he just didn't want to keep getting cast as the psych psychotic stepfather. No, no, I mean, I mean, right now, like okay. I, I guess it, it was reported online. I guess I don't know if it's true, but they 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 contacted him to be like, "Hey, can we interview for the for the special features?" And he was like, "No." So that makes me feel like he's um not really. I don't know. I mean, there's no way to know, but just in modern times, we haven't seen him really well uh i like i i hope he's like proud of it is all i'm saying i hope he like wants to celebrate yes i love the stepfather i'm in it i'm great in it like i hope he feels that way now like yeah it was a thing that held back my career back then because it made me a psycho and you know i never want to address that this is part of my 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 legacy and all that stuff i mean some people do like if they have a horror movie past some people do like try to sometimes separate themselves so jennifer aniston um anyway (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I hope I hope he doesn't see this like this is his leprechaun. It's a much much better movie. Well, well you so. know, you do remember now. I think it's because horror movies are becoming a lot more, like, not really mainstream, but a lot more respected now. Yeah, because there's a lot more people who love horror now. But it seems like a lot of the actors or actresses that did not care when they originally did the movie, like Jennifer Aniston, mm-hmm. they then. Now that it's more respected, they come out and say, "Oh yeah, I like doing the movie." It's like, make up your mind, lady. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I could, I, uh, everybody has to start somewhere. So, I mean, I think the only actor from back in the '80s who really liked doing it that wasn't playing the killer, sort of, was Matthew McConaughey because he said he had the the most fun he's ever had filming a movie was Texas Chainsaw Massacre Four. I've heard actually I've heard Kevin Bacon talk pretty well about Friday the 13th also uh, especially lately there's some interviews where he's he's proud of it so he Well to be fair I'm not I'm not surprised Kevin Bacon has no problem with that he, he's been in a decent amount of not really horror but thrillers which is which you can argue is a subsect of horror so yeah. he does like it I mean you got Stir of Echoes even which is a really good one you got Tremors which is a horror comedy mm-hmm. again to an extent <laughs> yeah he does have a you're right a couple uh hollow man don't forget hollow man too oh yeah hollow man uh well th- there was another there was a show my brother said he was really good in i oh, think the, it was the following yeah i think isn't that one where the they actually took the original script to scream 2 to make that show scream 3 yeah or scream 3 yeah, yeah. basically uh the killer's in jail and there's a cult outside that he's controlling they're doing like the killings for him yeah yeah but so you got um, that, which sounds like a horror thriller. Yeah. Well, um, either way, I, I'm just saying, like, I, I I would like to see more. I don't know, like I said, it'd be nice if like you went to like a horror con and like you're like, oh, Terry O'Quinn's here. We can get the the stepfather autographed. I just feel like it's like in a way sort of an iconic role. Um, I wonder but, what he, I, I wonder what character he played in Lost. Do you think it was the psycho? That would be ironic. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I, I've heard good things about Lost, but I've never watched it. Um, Neither have I. Um, but yeah, so I would say the um, props to the director of the movie. Like I said, the director definitely knows how to do thrillers for sure. Uh, props to the writer. Um, Tara Quinn makes the movie, in my opinion. He's a great performance. But um, Jill Sholin, I would say, also is like really fantastic as if you want to call her like the final girl here. Um, the movie only works because you care about her and you buy her they have like a big cat and mouse thing going on throughout the movie. Um, now she actually is in a couple things. She's in a movie called popcorn, which is apparently like a cult sort of horror classic from the eighties, which I need to actually learn more about. But then I noticed she's in um, the stranger, uh, sorry, the sequel to when a stranger calls back. Um, oh, I haven't seen that one yet. So you should watch that cause it's her. And then it does have the returning characters from the first one. Um, so yeah, I would, and it might, it might be on Tubi. It's actually a pretty, pretty good watch and she does a good job in that. Um, a fun fact about her too. So she, um, before she did this movie, she apparently was very close to getting the role in Labyrinth. So she screen tested for it. 
And then uh, Jennifer Conley ended up getting it instead. But uh, she was very close to getting that. And then she didn't get that and then got this. But uh, I, I'm i I'm thinking about I think she could have pulled off Labyrinth. Now, like, thinking about how she is here, I think that could have worked in that same kind of role. So that, well, she, prob that probably would have sent her career on a, a bigger direction, honestly. So Probably, but who would they have gotten to play her, play Stephanie and the stepfather? Jennifer Conley. <laughs> they just changed. They they just changed roles. Then well, much. they they can't do that because Jennifer Con Connelly, I think, was too young to do that kind of nude, uh, do a nude scene. Oh, at that point, they probably have to. Yeah, they probably have to edit that. So. <laughs> um. Anyways. Um. Oh, I would recommend watching part two of the movie of the series. The remake is somewhat rewatchable. The remake takes pieces of part one and two, uh, but they do do a weird thing where it's a teenage stepson instead of a stepdaughter. So it's not really, the threat's not there. Uh, have not watched Stepfather Part 3. Have heard nothing but bad things. But kind of like Prom Night 3, maybe we'll try it or not. All right, all right, all right. I said, I just I saw the possibility. We don't got to do it. Right. No, 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 no. I'm not... I got PTSD from watching that bullshit, okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I only watched it last week. I will say this, too. The Stepfather is one of those movies that the actress of this, too, she said that she said most people haven't seen it, but the ones who have seen it will come up to her and be like, oh, my God, you're in The Stepfather. She's like, it's one of those movies that, like, you either heard of it or you haven't heard of it, but if you have seen it, you like it a lot. But a lot of people have not heard of it or seen it, so... I, that, that's fair. I mean, I until I watched it what with with you about five years ago, I never even heard of it. So that was and that was the time when I first found it too. So I didn't growing up, I never heard of it either. So I was surprised to watch it and watch the sequel and all that. So all right, well, um, overall, people, we both recommend this. Go watch it on Tubi, where I watched it, or I guess Vic said it's free on YouTube. I wish I would have known that. I wouldn't have had to deal with ads. I could have finished it a little faster. And got on some games. Either way, and if, a, have... if a cop tells you to, I'd find a gun and blow him away. No, Jim. At that moment when you found him, you knew he was at the house. You could have told the local police. They would have showed up with a squad car. You'd have been better off than barging in the house and getting yourself killed. So, yeah, that's the bottom line. Either way, as always, if you know there's a serial killer in a house and you decide you're going to go in there to stop him, be more prepared. Don't don't be shocked by this blood on your face. He's a killer. What do you think's gonna be on his face? Mountain Dew? Come on. <laughs> <laughs>